Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Chapter 7, I've entitled this, The Pizza Man of Indiana, 
And I want to give you a story that uh, Franklin Graham put on Facebook. I think it will illustrate for you what we're talking about. But you know, the spirit of giving goes all the way back to creation. Very seldom do we think of that. For example, if you look at Genesis 1, 13 through 17, it says, God placed the sun and moon in the heavens to give light. Think of that. God promised to give special land to Abraham and his seed, Genesis 12, 7. He said, go out and into a land that I will give unto you. So giving is God's nature. He looks at us, the needy, and he gives out of himself what you and I need. When Abraham saw God as a giving God, he decided to do the same thing and uh, give back to God. And while God has no need, as you and I have need, God does know that you and I have a need to become giving people. People who are givers actually are in better health throughout their entire lives than people who are uh, stingy, self-centered, selfish. You remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, every time they went somewhere, they built altars and gave back to God a portion of what he had given to them. And the question that we have to ask ourselves when we see so much giving mentioned in the Bible is, are we giving people? That characterize us. One of my greatest fears I have always had, and that is of becoming a spiritual hoarder instead of sharing and giving. Moses taught the Israelites about giving. The 23rd chapter, he uses quite a few verses to focus on giving. He talks about providing for feasts, giving bird offerings, drink offerings. He talks about personal gifts. He talks about the free will offering. And then he talks about making vows in which you commit part of your life to something. Giving is the very nature of God. So when I give time and I give money and I give energy to something that pleases God, I'm actually being the most like God that I can be in this sinful body in which I live. Giving was a major part of all Old Testament emphasis on spirituality. So in this passage in Matthew chapter 7, uh, let's begin reading in verse 7, and here's what Jesus says. He says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. One of the chief principles in these few verses is the reciprocity of giving. God is a giver. We should give back to him. And also it illustrates it by talking about if earthly fathers know the distinction between the right kind of gift and the wrong kind of gift, doesn't the perfect God who created the universe know that as well? So God is a giving God. Uh, giving is good. Giving promotes spiritual health. And giving identifies us with the Lord and giving is seed planting for a harvest. Every time I give, I'm actually planting a seed. So I encourage you to be a giver. I want to tell you this story that Franklin Graham put on uh, Facebook called The Pizza Man of Indiana. It goes like this. For 31 years in a small town of Tipton, Indiana, a man by the name of Robert Peters delivered pizza to all the residents in the community, those who ordered pizza. He was interviewed one time and asked, why do you stay so long for all these years delivering pizzas for 31 years. He said, I just wanted to make people happy. You see, when I deliver pizza to someone, my face may be the only one they see for that day, and I like to leave them with a smile. The end of his quotation. Well, Robert built quite a reputation for customer service for the pizza company he worked for. The townspeople appreciated his attitude so much because every time he showed up at the door, he always had a smile. One customer noticed one day that Robert's 1993 Oldsmobile was on its last leg. 
And uh, so he's got the entire community together, and they said, look, Robert's been for 31 years delivering pizza. He's been helping us out. So he said, I want to get the community involved, and he did, and they gave Robert an amazing gift, a brand new car. Enough money came in not only to buy Robert a brand new shiny red Malibu, but there was money left over to pay insurance on it for a year and to provide gas for him. Robert said when he was asked about it, he said, well, this is the best tip I've ever gotten for simply delivering pizza. <laughs> but Robert gave a smile to others. Robert gave joy to others. Robert gave time to others. And every kindness that Robert did was a seed planted that resulted for him in an unexpected harvest. Hebrews 13, 16 says this, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. The Greek word translated communicate carries with it the idea of sharing resources, giving money and other resources. So the question is, where do you and I stand today in this matter of giving? I want to give you an outline that I think will maximize the blessings that you get from giving. A lot of people have actually told me that they wouldn't go to a church that was always demanding money. And I said, well, then you need to come here because I don't always demand money. And uh, they never did, of course. I said, I believe this. I believe that if the hearts of people are right, I don't have to get up and ask for money every service. I believe that I could just simply preach the word of God and God will deal with the hearts of people. So let me give you this outline. Number one, give without strings attached. Give without strings attached. Matthew chapter 4, you remember that Satan had uh, confronted Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, and he promised to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. All he had to do was take this one string, and the string was, you got to worship me. You worship me, Jesus, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, you know, a true gift is never intended to manipulate the response. A true gift is never intended to manipulate the response. Peter had a little misconception about this. They were talking one day in Matthew 19 about uh, people that were unwilling to give up things to follow Jesus and all of that. And Peter blurted out, he said, Behold, we've forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? When he had called them, Jesus had warned all of his disciples, listen to the warning, and it makes you really understand that Peter was way out of line with that question. Jesus told him this in Matthew 8, 20. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He also said this in verse 34, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus never promised anything for following him. He expected Peter and James and John and the others to follow Jesus Christ in order to follow Jesus Christ. Give without strings attached. You know, being a giving Christian starts with your life. If your life is turned over to the Lord, you'll never have a problem with any other giving. Never. So as long as the self is most important, that will be reflected in the absence of your giving. Give with no strings attached. Give to the Lord even if there is no evidence of a return. Let me give you a second point here. When you give, leave the outcomes to God. When you give, leave the outcomes to God. You see, as soon as I give to the Lord, and I can only give through his church, I can't uh, go up to heaven, knock on the gate, and say, Lord, I got a check for you. <laughs> I can't do that. I have to use what God has allowed to remain on the earth, and that is his church. So when I give, I'm acting obediently. I'm acting obediently. And obedience and the sense of satisfaction that comes from obeying God will bring us the greatest reward in the future. 
You know, I've never regretted the money that I've given to God. I've never regretted giving my life to him. I've never regretted giving to him by helping others. Never regretted it. Let God decide on the returns. You just be obedient in giving. Now, if you and I decide what the returns ought to be, then we're going to be eventually be totally dissatisfied with the entire matter of giving. Because of our nature, we would never be satisfied with the results of giving. You see, giving is serving. A lot of people told me over the years, well, I can't do anything for the Lord. I can't serve him. I said, sure you can. How can I serve him? I said, well, one thing you can do is you can get a list of the names of people in church that are shut-ins, pray for them, write them cards of encouragement. Another thing you can do is you can make it a gift to the church financially, you know, starting with the tithe. I said, giving is serving. In Luke chapter 6, Dr. Luke records this in verse 38. He says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So when you give, you're planting seeds. What comes from a planted seed? The answer is harvest. It appears that the Savior was teaching his disciples and he was using his own awareness of what giving was about, not their awareness. He says, shall men give into your bosom? So how does God respond to my giving? Well, I've had God respond to my giving by touching somebody else's heart and that person gave to me at a moment I didn't know it. I remember this was several years back. I was going through a difficult time financially. I don't remember why or anything, but I, I really needed somewhere around $350, $400. And uh, it's going to create a real problem if I didn't get it. And so I was sitting in my office there, and uh, Kathy Smith came in, and she gave me the mail that came in for the day. I took one of the envelopes. I didn't recognize it. It looked like a personal envelope. So I opened the thing up. And on the inside, typed was, my God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. I looked at the return address, Seattle, Washington. I said, I don't know anybody in Seattle, Washington. So I opened it up, and there was a debit card in there. So I went down to the bank, and I said, is there any way you can check the balance on this debit card? She said, yeah. She checked it. She said, Pastor, it's $500 on this. I said, $500? She said, yeah. And I said, I don't even know the person this came from. Well, she happened to be a Christian, not, not a fundamental Baptist, but a Christian. She said, well, maybe the Lord just decided to give it to you. That's what I think he did. The outcome, leave it to the Lord. So when you give, don't have a specific expectation of what you think God ought to do to honor your faithfulness. And we expect God to honor our faithfulness and we're sitting patiently by waiting for it. It may be that our motive was wrong in giving in the first place. Plant the seed of giving. Let God determine the fruit that you will receive from the gift. Let me give you number three. <clears throat> number three. Give for the benefit of others. Our whole society teaches us to be self-centered. Everything about society, you know. You do this, you need that, you deserve this. Do this and you should get that. And everything that we get from kindergarten all the way through high school, and then if you go to college, you get the same thing. Um, I'm number one. But biblical love gives for the benefit of others. That's the whole thing behind John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said in John 10, 15, he said, I lay down my life for the sheep. I mean, what greater evidence of giving could you have than for someone to endure the cross and all the shame that it brought, all the pain that it brought, just so you could have eternal joy. 
He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, in John 10, 17, he said, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. Did you know that Christianity is the only religion in the world in which the founder is still alive? The whole idea of giving is sharing what resources we've been entrusted with for the benefit of others. There's no legitimate excuse acceptable to God for our not being a giving person. Every gift made to any person is also a gift to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now some people may say, well, I don't believe that for a minute. Well, would you believe Jesus? Here's what he said in Matthew 25, 40, verily, verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. That's what he said. An act of love toward others is an act toward the Savior. That story of Robert the Pizza Man of Indiana illustrates in a practical way the power of giving. There is no power in the selfish life, but there sure is power in the giving life. The selfish life is saturated with weakness. Selfish people are the weakest people on earth, though they'll tell you they think they're strong. Well, let me give you uh, a summary here real quickly. Uh, when you give, give with no strings attached. Just forget about expectations. Look, leads to the next one there. When you give, leave the outcomes to God. Let him decide what the return ought to be. And then focus on giving for the benefit of others. And let me give you the last point. Number four, give for the benefit of yourself. One of the worst things that you can do, and it'll destroy all the rest of your life, is to be selfish. That'll kill you. You can be saved and still be selfish. So when you give to others and you give for others, that's an investment. And the gift comes back to you. Somebody said that one of the greatest benefits of giving and sharing is that it eliminates selfishness. Well, that's true. You can't do both, right? <laughs> And then somebody says that one of the things that giving does is it develops within the person who does the giving, it, it, it develops the enablement of a sharing spirit. So when you give to others and for others, you become a channel for God's use. Years ago, when I used to go hunting, my granddad told me, he said, Look, he said, when you come upon standing water, if you're thirsty, don't drink it. Only drink running water. Very interesting when Jesus talked to the woman at the well in John 4. Uh, he referred to what he could give her as living water. The Greek word translated living can also be translated running. Running water, living water. My granddad always taught me this. He said, if you're out in the woods, he said, find a stream that's running, kneel down and scoop it up with your hand and drink from that, but don't drink where it pools. That's where the bacteria and other things begin to grow. Well, years ago, somebody did a study on the difference between the River Jordan and the Dead Sea. I had the privilege to stand in the River Jordan where Jesus, according to tradition, was baptized. I also went swimming in the Dead Sea. One of the things I noticed about where Jesus was baptized, the water was running. You could actually scoop it up and drink it. But then when you go to the Dead Sea, there's nothing that lives in the Dead Sea. No fish. Birds won't even fly over the Dead Sea. So when I went down to go swimming in the Dead Sea, you can't sink. The saline content makes the water so dense you can't sink. And they had I noticed that whenever they used the uh, 
the boats that the Israelis use for military purposes. They said they had to constantly bring them up out of the water, scrape the rust off of them, and repaint them. Dead Sea people receive, but they never give. River Jordan people give. No matter how much water flows out of the headwaters in Caesarea Philippi that feeds the River Jordan, the river just keeps on flowing. It gives to the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea gives nothing in return. So when you give to others and for others, you become a channel, not a Dead Sea. Stagnant pools are unhealthy, and stingy people are stagnant pools. Streams are healthy. Unselfish people are streams flowing to others. As a student of psychology, I read and study psychology cases, and I look at the comments that counselors make about the counselees that they've had over the years, and I noticed three things in one of the articles I read one psychologist said, selfish people need more counseling than unselfish people do. But he said, selfish people have more physical problems and diseases than unselfish people do. And then he said, selfish people also have severe emotional problems, much more than unselfish people. So we ask ourselves the question, why should I be a giver? Well, first of all, it blesses others. It blesses others. Secondly, it obeys the Bible. The Bible tells us to give. Thirdly, it creates a positive atmosphere. I've never been comfortable around stingy people because normally stingy people are also critical, fault-finding people. <laughs> But I am very, very comfortable around giving people because usually their statements are positive. They have a way of creating a positive atmosphere. And then why be a giver? Because it helps the person who's doing the giving. It helps me. It's an investment in me when I invest in others. And then last of all, why be a giver? Because it pleases God. Paul said that he built his entire life around pleasing God, not around pleasing men. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we thank you for your blessings in our lives. And right now we ask for your guidance and direction. May the Spirit of God move upon us in this moment as we open the altar. If anyone here needs to come and to trust Christ or anyone needs to come for some other reason, may this be the moment we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What page? 383. 382? 383. 383. 383. God spoke into your heart. Come as we say. of the blood. I think it will be a challenge to your heart. I think you'll, you'll be blessed by it. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and Paul, lead us in prayer.